Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, which is called Three Key Ingredients to a Successful Desktop Transformation. My name is Doug Lane. I'm the Director of Products here at AppSense, and I, uh, once again, thank you for taking the time today. Um, this is actually kind of a timely topic. There's been a, a lot of activity over the last week or so with Citrix Synergy in particular over in Barcelona around the concept of desktop transformation and what it means. There have been some, some big moves in the space with Quest software acquiring um, ChangeBase and then Citrix acquiring AppDNA. So it's, it's actually a very timely topic and I'm going to actually cover some of those technologies as I go through this. So um, uh, with that, I guess we'll go ahead and, and jump into it. Um, as we go through this, though, feel free um, at any time if you do have any questions, um, feel free to use the raise hand function within um, GoToWebinar and I'll, I'll try to take a pause periodically for questions. And I've also um, left a fair bit of time at the end uh, to tackle any questions as well. So we do want to keep this uh, you know, interactive and, and interesting. So um, your, your feedback and questions are welcome anytime. So you know, just to kind of set the stage here a bit around desktop transformation, it's kind of become a bit of a buzzword in the industry that, that all the vendors are kind of throwing out there. Um, and you know, my aim for today is to really get you thinking a little bit about both kind of defining what desktop transformation is in your mind and for your organization um, and also kind of thinking about it in a slightly different way than perhaps other vendors are, are kind of putting it forth. And um, you know, I'm, I'm not necessarily approaching this with, a, with an access bias. I think it's obviously you know, part of where I'm coming from, but I, I do think there are some general um, you know, kind of best practices around how you look at transformation that, that you know, apply to AppSense as well as any number of other vendors that I'll mention that are important to consider as you're thinking about where you want to take your desktop. And, you know, as far as kind of framing the desktop transformation that's underway, really what's happening is that many organizations are moving from a, a more standardized and, and monolithic desktop, uh, typically a PC, with all, all the applications directly installed into the operating system, and um, you know, primarily are, are dealing with every aspect as kind of a, a one-off. So each user has their own PC. Even if you're starting with a, a standardized image, it becomes fairly um, divergent once you apply it to a particular user's PC. Um, and in turn, it's been quite difficult from an IT standpoint to keep these things up and running and update them and migrate them and what have you. Um, what we've seen over the last couple of years is that there have been a whole bunch of technologies put forth, uh, Windows 7 obviously being a, an operating system decision that, that organizations need to make, virtual desktops, um, terminal services have been around for a while but are kind of you know, increasing in, in popularity, and then other things like application virtualization as well as some of the emerging technologies around uh, software as a service, cloud, mobile devices, so a whole bunch of things happening. And I think what's starting to become clear is that you, know, you, you can't really get bogged down in the underlying technology. Some of these will be important to you, others will not. But at the end of the day, what you ultimately are trying to get to is a model where your users are kind of getting a, a you know, kind of consistent and well-managed um, computing experience regardless of all the underlying technologies that maybe you're dealing with as an IT organization. And a lot of that comes with moving from physical to virtual. At the same time, uh, our view is that physical PCs are not going away anytime soon. I think you know, many of you would agree with that. So it's important that you have an approach that is heterogeneous in, in, in nature so that you can deal with both a mixed environment in the short term as well as take on any other things that may be on the horizon that you haven't planned for yet. So ultimately what you want to get to is, is kind of a, a shift from a, a device-centric approach that maybe you have today to more of a people-centric approach where you can look at things at a user level as opposed to trying to keep up with the influx of devices coming into the organization as well as these new deployment models like desktop virtualization. What's driving this? So um, there, there are a number of things, depending upon who you ask. If you look at it from a business standpoint, there are a lot of benefits to be had around security, um, cost reduction, primarily on the operational side. I think you know fewer seeing cost savings in hardware moving to desktop virtualization, for example. But there are operational efficiency savings to be had. And then I think also you know just dealing with the the fact that users are more mobile and trying to make them as productive as possible while at the same time preserving security, preserving governance of sensitive data and, and policies and what have you. So that's you know, a lot of business drivers um, at play here. And I think from a user standpoint, they also value that productivity and they want to take advantage of new computing models, new devices, so that they can be productive, whether at the office, at home, on the road, uh, what have you. And they also are you know, increasingly users are developing their own tool sets around the applications that make them more productive. So along with the corporate applications that they may be assigned by IT, they have other types of things that they um, use to do their job that maybe aren't as tightly controlled by IT. 
And it's generally been kind of a, um, a balancing act where you do want to encourage that behavior, but at the same time, you can't throw all of your policies out the window because it could introduce other issues around security and support. So, um, you know, obviously it's a driver, but it's something that, that you need to manage carefully, and, and we'll get into that in a little more detail. And then finally, for the, for the folks on the IT side that are actually managing this infrastructure, what they're really looking for is additional flexibility. So today, with a, a PC-centric world, they're very constrained around what they can do. Often they're forced to kind of lock things down or um, not lock them down and, and face the consequences in terms of, uh, you know, the, the support burden that it creates. Um, ultimately, what IT wants is to be able to, you know, easily plug in new technologies and take advantage of them to make their life easier while at the same time not disrupting their user base in the process. And, and, and in an ideal world, they wouldn't even notice. So um, that's ultimately a key driver. And then I think also there are these other trends uh, that we'll touch on in more detail around things like consumerization of IT or, you know, kind of practical project needs like being able to take costs out of things like virtual desktop infrastructure that are of major concern. So um, it's kind of a perfect storm where a, a lot of different factors across all these different constituencies are driving towards a need to transform how desktop computing occurs. And, you know, if you, if you kind of put this in the, in the context of, of kind of a, a high-level evolution that we've seen, I think, you know, many of you that have been in, in this uh, IT space for a while, you know, probably remember the bad old days when you had kind of rogue IT users did whatever they want, computers were kind of new, and uh, there was very little control. We had the whole kind of uh, influx of, of worms and other security issues making their way into the organization. And where we all kind of steered was in the direction of locking down the desktop. So, you know, we can't go there again, so let's just lock everything down not let users do anything, and that was kind of life in, in the mid-90s uh, for many of us. But there's some downsides to that as well, obviously, because users don't like it, they're less productive, and oftentimes even when you lock things down, users can be very creative in finding workarounds to do what they want to do. Um, so in, in some ways, it's kind of putting your head in the sand a bit, um, taking that type of approach. Um, where I think a lot of organizations have gotten to today, and this is certainly an area that, that we play heavily, is this idea of user-centric IT. So being able to enable additional flexibility around um, where a user is computing, whether it's on a desktop, uh, physical PC, virtual desktop, Citrix session, whatever the case may be, and providing a consistent experience around that. And not everyone's doing that today, but it is something that, that certainly our customers are, are kind of arriving at. But we think that's not really the end game yet. We think there is more on the way in terms of you know, cloud computing, you know, bring your own device, consumer IT programs that are really in the early stages and it requires even further innovation to occur from companies like AppSense and others in the space to, to enable that. So we don't think this is done yet. We do think this user-centric IT is, is, is a, a stepping stone, though, to get there. Um, it's certainly one that, um, that is, is a big focus of our business. So um, what, does it, what does it mean to kind of get to this people-centric world of the future? I think, you know, first and foremost, reducing complexity for everyone involved, so getting the user um, you know, kind of separated out from the, the equipment that they're computing on. And the way that you do that is through a life cycle approach to transformation. So I think this is an important point. We're not, um, you know, kind of thinking about transformation as being a one-way street. So I think that's where, you know, if you look at other uh, companies out there talking about desktop transformation, what they think, what they're kind of positioning that is, you know, we have a product that gets you to a VDI model uh, we have a product that gets you to Windows 7 on a physical PC, and that's not transformation. That's a one-way uh, street to someplace else, which you know may or may not be the right place right now, but at the end of the day, it may be the wrong place tomorrow, or even today, you may have a mix of needs that aren't addressed by that. So what we kind of advocate is the idea of looking at transformation as a, a competency and not a, not a project. It's not a point-in-time activity. Instead, it's kind of a, a set of skills and tools that allow you to flexibly um, adapt to change in your environment. And um, we see kind of three, three key ingredients to this, this competency around transformation and making a, a life cycle um, uh, approach part of your, your way of doing things. And the first is to really assess what you have today. Um, and I'll get into more detail around what I mean by that. Uh, the next is to, to analyze the, the, what you find there and, and in the process chart your course for where you want to go moving forward. And it could be a combination of things. It could be some physical PCs. It could be some VDI. It could be some terminal services. It could be application virtualization uh, or any combination. So I think it's uh, you know a key step. And again, I'll get into each of these in more detail. 
And then finally, once you've created your blueprint, you need a mechanism for making it happen, and that's this deploy element of the life cycle. Um, again, then it'll also get into what, what comprises that. And I think in all cases, this has to apply across the board. It's not just a VDI thing. It's not just a PC thing. It's an everything thing where you need to be able to apply it to traditional PCs that you may have in place, as well as a heterogeneous collection of other types of computing models that you may have introduced or plan to introduce in the future. And this is something, this is not an absence life cycle. Uh, obviously, we're trying to, to, to kind of drive this thinking, but we see it as, uh, you know, really an ecosystem. And I think if you followed some of the announcements we've made lately around our absence affinity alliance program, some of the partnerships we've struck with companies like Centric Software, Lakeside Software, AppDNA, um, some of the longstanding work we've been doing with the likes of Citrix and VMware and Microsoft, um, you know, we don't see this as something where Asset is going to come in and sell you the solution to this problem. We like to think we can be a big part of the solution, um, but it's really an ecosystem that needs to come together to give you the tools you need to operate in this kind of way. Um, and you can see here, you know, some of the players that, that work across these different areas in the assessment stage, you know, this is really where Centrix and Lakeside are strong, and I'll go into a little bit about what they do. Um, Analyze is kind of where you move from some of those technologies into players like AppDNA, um, who can, can uh, again, provide additional steps along the way. And then when the, the time comes to deploy, you, you have a, a mix of technologies in terms of the actual desktop delivery, application delivery tools out there, like Citrix, like Microsoft AppB or System Center, uh, VMware View, but then you also have tools like AppSense that can bring it all together and create a bridge between your PCs, your virtual desktops, your various application deployment models to give you that flexibility to adapt over time as well as optimize the given implementations of each of these uh, tools that you may be using. So let's throw a little bit into the assess uh, you know, element of the life cycle, what's that about? And really what this is, is, is kind of getting your arms around what you have today. So before you figure out how you're going to change things, you know, for many organizations, the first step is just understanding how you do it today, what applications are in use, and what options do you have in terms of being able to um, evolve how you're delivering some of those desktops and applications. So some of the partnerships that we've established with companies like Centrix and Lakeside allow you to do just that, where you can deploy um, collection uh, software, or, you know, data collection software on your existing desktops, collect valuable usage information around what users are doing, what applications are they using, uh, what types of things need, do you need to consider going forward, you can't just kind of make blanket assumptions that certain applications aren't being used if you don't actually know that to be the case because it will certainly bite you later uh, when a user is disrupted from doing their job under the new model. So it's really all about creating a baseline of what you have today, who's using what, um, and then taking a user focus to it. So rather than looking at it at a device uh, angle, thinking about it from a user standpoint so that you know, you know, does this user need to stay on a physical PC? Could they potentially be move to a virtual desktop, or do they need a combination of things, a tablet experience, a VDI experience, and maybe a physical PC experience. Um, I think at the end of the day, we, we, you know, we still um, we are kind of early days with some of these partnerships, but we're already seeing some great integration points where, uh, for example, with Lakeside, you can run their technology, and they've, they've created a custom user virtualization uh, report output where, in addition to all the great data you get out of their tool, Natively, you get a very user virtualization focused report that then provides a great uh, entree into setting up your assets environment and figuring out how to manage this change. So um, more to come in that area, but already some great work happening with some of these partners. The next kind of competency that, that um, is important, and this, this is an you know, extremely important one, particularly with things like Windows 7 migration, is the ability to analyze that data. So once you have that baseline, um, either you know, because you, you have it on your own or because you've used Lakeside or Centrix to be able to give that to you. The next step is trying to make sense out of it and chart your strategy for how you plan to service these users going forward. Um, you know, important insights that you get out of a tool like FDNA are things like, will this application work with Windows 7? Will it work on a 64-bit instance if I'm coming from 32-bit? Um, will applications uh, be deployable through ZApp? Maybe you're trying to move from locally installed apps with XP into ZAP or AppV, uh, these, these tools like AppDNA give you all those insights where you, know, where you can deploy this. So what we see is a lot of our customers will have, um, as they move to either VDI or move to Windows 7 on a physical PC, they'll have a particular hierarchy in mind where you know, option one is they want to use ZAP as their preferred deployment model. They find through AppDNA that that's not possible. They fall back to maybe AppV as a second choice. 
Um, if that's not possible, they fall back to um, a, a traditional MSI-based installation. But through these tools, you can really create that blueprint. But inevitably, you are going to have a mix of deployment options, which is, again, where you know, technologies like AppSense that can allow you to roam across different deployment methods uh, become very important. It's a big part of why we've chosen to partner with some of these companies. Um, and I think, you know, again, we're focusing this, focusing this all on the user aspect. So certainly applications and desktops are, are kind of ingredients being to surface, but we're rolling this all up to a user-centric view so that we can determine for that user how they can be serviced going forward. So that takes you to, the, to kind of the final element of the cycle, which is deployment. And um, this, this could mean any number of different things. It could be as simple as moving from a physical uh, Windows XP PC to a, a native Windows 7 PC and, and perhaps using new technologies to deliver apps like AppV or, or, or Zapp. Or it could be doing a mix of things. Maybe some of your users will be on PCs. Some will move to virtual desktops. Um, some will, will have a mix of desktops and, and tablets that perhaps they're accessing corporate resources remotely with. Um, the, the key point here is that no matter which deployment method you choose, um, inevitably it's going to be a mix. So I don't think any, any organization out there, you know, with, for the most part, is going to have one answer to how they deploy desktops and how they deploy applications. There will be a mix of things that, that you use, and you'll choose the right tool for the situation. And uh, this is really an important element, uh, is, is kind of recognizing that, not kind of buying a, a marketing message from one vendor that they have all the answers. I, I, would, I would argue that no vendor has a 100% a, a answer in terms of how you can deploy desktops and applications. It's always going to be a mixture. And, and recognizing that and having a plan in place to deal with that is, is going to be you know, central to your, your, your transformation life cycle. And I think also to the extent that you, you plan for that, plan for change, plan for heterogeneity, you're going to be better able to adapt when new, new technologies like cloud applications and uh, more you know, kind of tablets and smartphones emerge on the scene. If, you, if you're set up to be able to manage a heterogeneous environment, adopting those things and embracing them is going to be much easier down the road. Um, in addition, you know, I think often you know, if you put it in the context of Windows 7, many organizations are looking at Windows 7 migration as kind of a point in time project. And then meanwhile, we see Microsoft already out there releasing developer preview of Windows 8. So it feels like kind of an unwinnable battle where there's always something new coming along. So again, to the extent that you can set, it, set yourself up where you can embrace change and, and support heterogeneity, heterogeneity within your environment, you're going to be much happier going forward. So why is transformation needed? I think we touched on this a little bit earlier, but you know, just to, to kind of use an example to, to put a finer point on it, there's just a lot of change happening that's not necessarily generated by the IT organization. It's just market conditions, user activity that are really creating what I view as kind of an untenable situation for many IT teams in that the number of personal devices emerging is, is really um, growing as you have users that in the past may have had a single standardized PC on their desk now have um, devices like tablets, smartphones, netbooks. Um, the number of sheer devices are going up, and the line between a corporate device and a personal device is getting a bit blurry. And then with those new devices are coming more applications. Uh, a typical user uh, that we found has about 14 different business applications, 22 mobile uh, or personal applications, and three different computing platforms. So ultimately, what this translates into is unique configurations. So each one of these unique combinations of a user, a device, and an application set is another unique instance that IT needs to worry about. And once you get up to a billion or so different unique configurations, it, it, you're kind of at a point where you're just not going to be, ever be able to manage it looking at it from a device-centric view. Uh, and then further compounding matters is the fact that more and more uh, work is being done on the road where the management and security challenges become even greater. So this is kind of a, you know, something that is happening, you know, kind of like it or not. Uh, we'd love to, to try to slow this or, or stop it, but at the end of the day, it's happening, and it's probably the right thing for, for our businesses, but we need, as, as IT professionals, a way to, to deal with it. And I think, you know, from our standpoint, you know, having, having set the stage a bit with a, a little bit about the ecosystem, um, I think what we're focused on here at AppSense is this idea of abstracting the user persona from the underlying technology. So, uh, whereas in the past, everything was kind of tangled together, operating system, applications, user data, which in turn, as I mentioned earlier, makes it uh, more difficult for IT to manage. Um, instead, you know, what we're kind of putting forth is a model where, you know, as you're gaining this insight through these different elements of this life cycle, 
a common thread as is that you're separating out the user persona from the underlying technology, and that's a big part of how you're able to adapt as things change or as you have a heterogeneous collection of desktop and application deployment models. So the idea here really is to kind of decouple that user element, bring it back into a centralized management and policy framework, and then you can kind of mix and match different deployment technologies, both physical and native, I'm sorry, physical and virtual, and be able to apply that personalization on demand as users roam between them, but of equal importance, apply policy to it that can even adapt as they move throughout the different uh, uh, computing models in different locations. And I'll, again, cover that in more detail. Um, so what do I mean by user persona? I think oftentimes you know, people will immediately focus their attention on the Windows profile uh, and profile management, and certainly that is a piece of it, but there's really much more to it. Uh, there, there are elements of, um, you know, kind of OS-level personalization, application-level personalization, um, things like user rights, what the user is allowed to do, things like policies, you know, what, how should the desktop adapt as users move between floors in the office, as between business locations, between home and work, uh, between different security uh, uh, environments, perhaps in the corporate office versus that Starbucks across the street. Um, so all of these things, whether they're more tangible personalization elements that the user sees, or their um, policies that you as the IT organization are applying behind the scenes, they all kind of roll up into this, this digital DNA for a given user. And to the extent that you can manage that and apply it across the board and adapt as, as situations change, you're going to be well positioned for dealing with um, this transformation that's happening. Um, you know, we see kind of three key elements to it. There's, there's kind of the initial step of decoupling the user from the underlying OS application device having a central place that is the canonical view of that user. So typically in our world, this is a, a back-end database that is the master you know, kind of record of that user persona and the policies around it. And then being able to deploy that on demand, it's one thing to kind of pull everything back into a database, but if you can't deliver it to a new computing environment within seconds, you've really lost the battle because users have seen this in the past with things like roaming profiles where you know, you, you, you log on, you have a personalized experience 10 minutes later once the whole profile comes down. So it's critical to be able to deliver this personalization and, the, and these policies on demand without adversely affecting the user experience at login time or during usage. I think, uh, you know, thinking about this, again, as, uh, from the standpoint of users and not devices, um, you know, just some, some more specific examples. So what, what are some of the policies that you might want to to have adapting as users move between your different computing models. So which, which drives are they able to see? Which printers are they able to see? Um, if, they are, if they're on the third floor, you'd ideally want the third floor point printer. If they're across the street at Starbucks, you may not want any printers because the more likely you know, scenario is that they accidentally print something to a printer where they're not located. Um, you know, what things do you want to do around triggering uh, folder, folder access, um, certain user rights within the, the environment? And again, adapt this on a, on a contextual basis. So as they move between uh, contexts, these policies can adapt to give them a personalized experience where you also, as the IT staff, know that they're getting the right um, level of access, the right level of functionality. Um, obviously, personalization is, is a key element. Users um, are, are making these desktop environments their own. They want to be able to personalize look and feel, settings, preferences have those things carried with them as they move between different environments, again, while not um, having that adversely affect their, their desktop experience. And then also, I think, you know, from a, a, a permissions uh, and rights standpoint, um, as an IT organization, you're taking a leap of faith here by giving up your kind of device-centric view of things. It's much easier to say, this is a device, I've locked it down, I know exactly what can be done. Taking more of this user-centric view, again, it requires a leap of faith. You have to say, you know, I'm confident enough that I've built a set of policies and, and contextual um, rules around this user that even as they move between different devices, different contexts, I feel comfortable that I've got corporate uh, and IT governance in place that I, that I could feel good about. So um, that's, that's uh, of critical importance. I think also as you adopt new computing models, licensing challenges come into play, particularly with things like terminal services where you may have an expensive application that you want to serve up remotely to users through something like Citrix. Um, in, in traditional sense, you may have to license that for every theoretical user, whereas by, by giving greater control over which users can, can launch which applications, we can help you rein in those licensing costs. Um, and then finally, I think user rights in particular uh, is, is a, a very useful thing to, to consider because often many of you are probably coming from a Windows XP world where you perhaps have had to give more people admin rights than, than you'd like to have. 
Um, and that's obviously created challenges from both a security and support standpoint. So moving to virtual desktops or moving to Windows 7 or even just uh, you know, kind of evolving how you deal with your current systems, uh, you can really get to a much more granular view of how you manage those user rights. There's technology out there that will allow you to selectively elevate rights so it's not a black and white world anymore where they either have every, every, every right or they have no rights. Um, I think also, you know, looking at it from the standpoint of applications, I think Windows has gotten a lot better around, um, you know, user access control and user rights governance around application launches. But again, it's not a black and white world. You may want to give users free reign around certain applications, but not on others. So having this user-centric view and be able to apply policies around what they can do can really help with that. So ultimately, where we're trying to get to, you know, talking from an absence standpoint, is, is really this, this idea of user liberation. Um, from a, you know, a technology standpoint, there's just a lot happening out there right now, uh, and the lines are going to blurring between, um, you know, more personal-oriented technologies like, say, Dropbox versus corporate technologies. Ultimately, where we see ourselves, and you see this reflected in some of the new branding that Appsets recently launched, is we see ourselves as kind of that intersection between the personal technology space and the corporate technology space making sure that users can have the flexibility to do what's going to make them productive, but while at the same time uh, not having that come at the expense of IT governance and IT control. So I think, you know, we're, we're kind of, um, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the foundational stages of that with our, our user virtualization model today, but it's an area that we're really focused on in our R&D efforts around uh, cloud computing, mobile devices, and other areas. So you can expect to see more from us in the future around um, you know, trying to break together this world of personal computing and corporate computing. So, um, you know, I think, you know, more to come on this. This was intended to be kind of an introduction to the, the idea and to kind of get you thinking a bit about desktop transformation being something that is more of a life cycle than a point in time project. And I think, you know, if I can leave you with a second key takeaway, it's that, you know, again, physical PCs are not going away. Getting to VDI is not desktop transformation. It's really getting to this world where you can adapt to a combination of technologies, which is ultimately the, the likely scenario for you. So um, if I've left you with those two, two takeaways, I, I, I'll feel pretty successful with, with today's webinar. Um, but, you know, more to come on this topic. We actually are planning a follow-on series of webinars uh, on this topic where we dive deeper uh, with some of these different partners into the, the, the three key ingredients of this desktop transformation lifecycle. So stay tuned for those. Uh, we're also working on some white papers and materials to, to kind of help you uh, get your head around this and figure out what makes sense for you. Um, you know, look for some, some additional videos. Uh, we have some great thought leaders like Harry Labana, our CTO, um, is just, you know, prolific on this topic and, and is really a great, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, guy to, to take a look at. Um, and I think also just keeping the dialogue active on social media. I think as we've seen the developments this week around, um, you know, Citrix Synergy with the AppDNA and change-based moves, um, you know, we've, we've been pretty vocal about our view on it and on, on blog posts and on Twitter. So if you, if you partake in those things, we'd love to, to engage with you. Feel free to, uh, to uh, ping us on Twitter or comment on a blog post. And it's a great way for us to make sure that what we're doing is grounded in the realities that you all as IT professionals are, are facing every day. Um, so with that, that's, that's all I have in terms of prepared, um, you know, content. So maybe I'll, I'll take a point here and just see if we do have any questions. Uh, more comments. Um, there, there uh, is a, a raise hand function within GoToWebinar, so I definitely invite you to use that and then allow me to take you off mute so you can ask your question. And um, if you don't have uh, any immediate questions or if you think of a question later, um, you will get a, a follow-up email um, that you can reply to or I've also put up here my email address and my Twitter ID so you can feel free to uh, engage uh, after the fact if you do have any questions or feedback. Okay, doesn't look like we have any questions. So uh, once again, do invite you to, to follow up after the fact if you do think of any. And um, in closing, I'd just like to thank you all for joining today's webinar. I know it's a, a time commitment to join these things. And um, you know, we're, we're pleased that you're able to join us today. Hopefully it's been informative. And uh, once again, you know, wholeheartedly heartedly encourage you to communicate with us after the fact, you know, both positive and, and, and negative around uh, ways we can make these things more helpful to you. So thanks again, and I look forward to, to hearing from you soon.